If you want to support the channel, then please check out my Patreon page to gain access to exclusive videos, take part in Q&As, and watch my retrospectives before they go live on YouTube. Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here. For this spoiler discussion on No Time To Die, I'm joined by James Bond fans and authors AJ Chowdhury, co-writer of Some Kind Of Hero, and Mark O'Connell, writer of Catching Bullets, Memoirs Of A Bond Fan. We are going to be exploring the film's plot and some of the elements that may have left fans upset or completely satisfied by the end. I've already discussed my thoughts on the film in a non-spoiler fashion. You can find a pop-up link in the top right hand corner of the video. But first I want to give AJ and Mark a chance to get their thoughts across. So AJ, you know, can you tell me your general thoughts on the film? Did it live up to your expectations and was it worth the wait? Oliver. When I decanted from the Royal Albert Hall on the 28th of September this year, after attending the Royal World Charity Premier of No Time to Die, I was completely discombobulated. I didn't know what to think. I was completely all at sea with No Time to Die. I'd waited, as you said, six years. We'd all waited. Was it worth the wait? At that point, you shouldn't have asked me. I went on to do a bunch of media, radio interviews, and I was just working it out. And I've said before that, when you see a really good Bond film for the first time, but a slightly different Bond film, it's a bit like eating an ice cream too fast. You have an ice cream headache. You know it's good. You've enjoyed it, but you just can't get your finger on it. And it's got this amazing, brave ending, which no one has prepared us for. Um, just to go back to the ending, you know, he, we see him die in an explosion. There's no way out of that. He's also been poisoned. He's also been shot many times. Uh, you know, even James Bond can't survive this. I think that was the point. Or actually, I, I suspect it was Daniel Craig's agent's uh, point because they said, if we do this last one, we want him to, we want a finality to it. We want it, a, a hard red line under it. And I suspect that's what happened. As we all know, and we'll discuss, Bond has died many times before in the Fleming books. At the end of From Russia With Love, he's poisoned by Rosa Klebb's shoe. He collapses to a wine red floor, cliffhanger. In the novel, you only have twice. He's left for dead and we see an obituary. Of course, we know he's not dead. He's just got uh, lost his memory and heads to Russia and Vladivostok, where he'll get brainwashed by the Russians. So it, there is a precedent for killing Bond off, quote unquote. And this one, I thought, was going to do it like that. Leave you on a cliffhanger. He'd been poisoned and collapses on on that sort of structure and we see the explosions go all around him but he dies you know i'm i know i'm doing this with mark o'connor we were both at the premiere we hung on we clung on for those credits and by god at the end when it did say james bond will return the crowd were ecstatic we cheered and we needed that we needed that badly i needed it badly um so yeah i i that's a long answer to a short question oliver um and subsequently i've seen it a number of times since then and it's an amazing brave piece of cinema you know the popular culture of cinema you know i think it's really really well done yeah the, the film ended I, I was left initially frozen by the film i wouldn't say i was left cold that's not accurate at all but i was left frozen by the film and there was that awkward moment where oh there's no easter fabache egg marvel minded sequence here i thought we might have q going oh hang on i see the trident symbol going under the water here, you know, maybe the glider plane has uh, led to Bond's escape, or just leave it with a little <laughs> open door rather than a sort of barricaded uh, Eastern European 60s war, which they kind of did. But I think, I mean, I, I'm getting this a lot from civilians and non-Bond fans. They're going, I, I want to see it again. I need to see it again. And not because things were perhaps unclear, although there is a little bit of that at some point, just tiny, a uh, tiny amount of confu story confusion but that people just want to take it in again. And then I saw it at an Eon screening uh, a couple of days after the premiere in a, in, actually in a cinema. One thing to remember about the Albert Hall, it's an amazing sort of amphitheater launch pad for Bond. It makes perfect sense to have the premieres there, but it isn't actually a cinema. The screen was great, but the sound, whilst it was very booming and loud, is it's you know it is it is not a uh, you know the uh, 150 year old building is not made for uh, projecting movies so it kind of just slightly affected it. and you only realise how it affected it when you see it in a proper big contemporary movie screen and I did I saw it at Leicester Square a few days later and it all just fell into a, a beautiful poignant 
easy place, you know, for, for a nearly three hour film. I've seen it three times so far. It hasn't once dragged. It's a bit like, like AJ said, I find it's a bit like losing one's virginity for the first time when you see a new Bond film. Um, yes, I've gone there. <laughs> uh, you're just trying to work out the mechanisms, where things are, where, you know, how it, how it begins and how it ends. And, um, and then afterwards, when you go back and hopefully you get a second chance at such things, um, you, you, you just see how it breathes, how it sits or, or stands or, or kneels or whatever. And it, it just fell into a beautiful, beautiful place because you know the, the big story bangs. I mean, I don't know if anyone's listening to this who doesn't mind spoilers, but the, the fact that Bond dies in the closing beat of No Time to Die is not its only big story, uh, you know, explosion. There's one or two others. And they all make a perfect sense when, when you see it a second time. So, you know, fair play on uh, Eon and the, uh, Fukunaga for making a film that actually people are going to want to see twice because it's going to help the box office. But we're also completely overwhelmed by yes. the atmosphere of a premiere, seeing all the stars up close. Uh, and you've got, you've got David Zeritzi with the Bond experience, Calvin Dyson. You've got all sorts of James Bond fans, old and young, you know, Dave Worrell, Tim Greaves. You've got uh, I mean, Mark Guest was Mark Gassis, um, and you've got a panoply of people. And, and uh, I, I took my 17-year-old nephew, and he was pointing out all the YouTubers and rap stars and footballers that you know passed unnoticed to me while I was look. I was chatting to Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, uh, Mark Tilsley, the production designer, I spoke to Stephen Saltzman. All these people. It's like a, the, the, the James Bond convention of conventions, and then you see the movie in. Yeah. An auditorium, as Mark says, isn't really designed for us. Yes. And then the second time I saw it was at the one minute past midnight on the 30th of September at the IMAX in Waterloo, which was a wonderful experience. Oh, wow. Brilliant. And the thing that Mark says about seeing it in a proper cinema with civilians is, and then we, we, we both saw it at a cast and crew screening um, a couple of days later, is that the audience give it energy and pulse and vibrancy and seeing people mm. cheering on James Bond's cheering, seeing people cheering, shake and not stir, it really pumps energy for in this first week in this country. Bond is a cultural heirloom. It's it's not just a movie. And after the pandemic, Bond is now a bit of history. People who are never seeing Bond films at the cinema are seeing it. I'm getting messages. I'm sure Mark's getting messages. I'm sure Oliver, you're getting messages from oh, people. Sure. Have you seen the Bond movie yet? There's an excitement and a vibrancy about this movie at the cinema. And by God. We need to see it at the mm. cinema because, well, we'll get on to that, but it is a made film made for the cinema. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've got all neighbours and cousins and friends. And one thing I'm finding, and I, I think I know why, but a great reaction to it is coming from women. They really like and rate and value this, this film and the story punches it, it brings to itself. I, I think it's, it's had a very unexpected reaction there. And, um, you know, that's... Uh, whilst it's not accidental, I, I think it's uh, a great testament to the non-Bond fan audiences that are out there and their adoration over 16 years for Daniel Craig. It really is the culmination of what he's done. And as Mark says, I think this film actually stands alone in itself. And sometimes I think it's best to see it like that. And you're right, the emotional heft of the movie um, after Skyfall, this packs a punch. And I think mm. Bond sort of has outmaneuvered itself from its contemporaries like Bourne and Mission Impossible, whose action is wonderful and Tom Cruise does his stunts. But when you see this movie, in the pre-title sequence, you go, only Bond can do this. Only Bond has mm. the weight, the depth, the feeling, the hinterland to do this. And when by the time you see the end of it, with all the car, the Whitehall Brigade, with all the elements you've seen kick into place. And by the way, we've seen a very traditional Bond movie. This is, it's got wonderful Bondian tropes that really update and are magnificent, which we'll get into. So it is very much a Bond movie, but it's beyond Bond. It's taken an emotional heft. It's taken something Bond films have never done before and made it work within the terms of this particular movie. So mm -hmm. Bond fans, I think, are a little bit, slightly take a bit of time to come round to it because they're still fighting the elements of formula that have been junked or changed. Whereas a civilian goes in and just accepts it exactly for what it is. They haven't been following the press. They haven't been following every nitty gritty morsel of it. They just watch it for what it is. And on that term, it's, in those terms, it's magnificent. One of the striking things I found out, felt about it was that it, 
mentioning you know the, the natural born uh, Ethan Hunt uh, peers that are surrounding the Daniel Craig era, and yeah, I always say, well, well, when there's Jason Bourne twenty five, we'll talk about um, how Bourne has overtaken Bond. Don't think it has, but one thing, particularly the opening title sequence, which mostly takes place in uh, well, a sort of Norway uh, prelude, then a Matera Italy um, action sequence. But one thing that Bond is able to do, and I think it's a mark of its confidence and a mark of 25 movies, it can pull its punches. The Matera sequence is not the biggest action sequence in the world. Had it been the had Matera Italy been the opening bike chase of Mission Impossible 11, it would have been bigger and bolder. And it would have been great for sort of stunt movie bells and whistle reasoning, but it wouldn't have maybe served with the narrative. And I think that just as an example, the biggest the biggest stunt of No Time to Die's pre-title sequence is what uh, Lea Sadu does on with her performance. I think she she's a quivering, nervous wreck. And I uh, as the title's kicked in, I went, oh, I I see sort of trade ads for you know for your consideration for her performance in this one. And I, I don't say that lightly as well because I, I and it all makes full circle sense after Spectre. But Bond has got this film particularly has got enough confidence to not over you know over whip the omelette or whatever the phrase might be. <laughs> so, Laz, now with with the sequels to Casino Royale, you know, we saw this long running narrative, ignoring the old traditions of standalone adventures. Does No Time to Die sort of tie up this long running story neatly, or feel somewhat stuffed with too many plot lines in its efforts to tie up any loose ends? It does. I mean, my I sort of my parents on round two, and they were a little lost. I suddenly realised at the end. I, I was going to text them during the week and say, watch Spectre, um, and I forgot. So they were a little adrift. It does work as a standalone bomb film, but you may have to have the precursor and epilogue, or prologue rather, that is Spectre. I think the film structurally manages to move beyond that point of finality that Spectre ended on, you know, with Blofeld being led away to Belmarsh Prison. You know, it's so glamorous. And um, it's, all, it's all very Dempsey and make piece that. I do have a, I thought like, Blofeld shouldn't be in some sort of Pentonville lock up you should be in some sort of i don't know japanese high-rise yeah. tower block prison but anyway um but it does and it kind of moves beyond the confines of spect you know literally we we see the you know the death of specter in all its forms and that's kind of happens earlier in the film than its final act but i do feel pers- i i do feel the film's also stretching to make those links but you know and i do feel that next time round we may very much so move away from Spectre and Blofeld. I, I, do, I, you know, I, I feel we might go back to a, a three-film arc with a new director and new Bond, but I do think we're going to move away from that, that heritage mm. of Bond. Because I was actually saying to a New York paper yesterday that that's great for us in our you know, early 20s, like we all are right now. But um, no, <laughs> but you think of, you know, it, it means less to the 17-year-olds. You know, DB5s and mahogany veneer... Uh, offices and double tufted leather doors mean less to the 17 year olds so i feel perhaps we've we've put a little lid on that a sort of bespoke lid on the, the sam mendes mahogany veneer uh, era and maybe we'll move on a bit oliver i think i think the publicity about this film tying up loose ends is just that publicity mm. there were no loose ends to be tied up um and we've had four films to do that i think it's their way of finding connectivity a retro connectivity this is one of the slight problems people have with this this sort of uh, messaging i think that you know you can see this film as a standalone movie it's very much its own bond film you never had this before as you've said i think tying up the loose ends of the bond girl going out into the sunset well bond's finished on a happy ending many times and we just see him brand new in a new film with a new circumstance. I think the Blofeldness of this movie was important to get it back. But once again, they've never really bothered. And in some ways, it's like a Russian doll set of villainous organizations. Organizations You've had Quantum, which was really Spectre, which is now really sort of dominated by Sapphire. Um, you know, will the real villainous organization please stand up? <laughs> Quite frankly, I, th- I think it's just just publicity thing to try and say, you know, there's a art connected. It never was. It was never meant to be. And they've done a great job. I actually feel this film stands alone quite well. Mm. And you don't really need to know. You, you bring back Felix Leiter, played wonderfully by Jeffrey Wright, just by the having by sheer dint of having the same actor for the first time play the character three times is enough. You know, just the casting is mm. enough. Having Blofeld being played by the same actor 
twice. I mean, it's remarkable that, that that's an achievement. Um, of course, Eric Pullman voiced him in From Russia with Love and Thunderball, so I don't get out outfanned by the fans here. But yeah, just to have uh, Christoph Waltz, I think his Hannibal Lecter appearance is really good. It's really interesting, but it's but it really I don't think it really changes much. Really, uh, you have a nice bit of moment where Bond seemingly strangles Blofeld, mm. saying "Die, Blofeld, die," which is from the novel "You Only Live Twice." Um, and then we find out that Bond's actually carrying inadvertently the poisons agent, which kills Blofeld. It wasn't the intention. Um, but you know, I really think, in a way, you can dial all that down. That's just messaging to try and get us to see it again. You, you could you could watch it as a standalone, really. Um, Leia Sadu just happens to be. I think she. I think it's really good. We've got that depth of relationship there, and it works. I'm. I'm one of. I, I loved Spectre personally. I bought that relationship in that movie, so I'm happy to return to it here. Others weren't, but yeah, that's my feeling about the Bond films. And here's the whole point: the next series, because there will be Bond, will have to be a. We'll have to sort of reboot it all. So none of this really will have mattered. Although I strongly suspect. They will recast um, Ray Fiennes, Naomi Harris, and Ben Whishaw, and Rory Kinnear as the Whitehall Brigade, uh, rather like they kept Judy Dench's M in Casino Royal. I mean, they always fudged the reboot there. So <laughs> they I do, think yeah. continuity, <laughs> continuity in Bond films, right from when Blofeld and Bond finally meet in You Only Live Twice, and then they finally meet again in Master Secret Service, and none recognize each other, probably because they're paid by two different actors, you know. They've never really kept to that world. So in, it's sort of in keeping with true Bond continuity that there is no Bond continuity. Yes, I mean, you've got, you've got a film that's got a oil painting of Judy Dench and Robert Brown as their as the, uh, respective M's. And a few people say, oh, well, how does that work? It's changing the, the timeline. I'm like, like AJ said, just forget the timeline. Yeah. You know, stick with your timeline of seeing the movie. Don't try and do it together. I, I'd actually be really sad to see the... Uh, the Whitehall Avengers uh, uh, bid goodbye to the, the whole thing. For, for another reason, they will actually be, be a little older, potentially, than, than the next Bond or slightly similar age when it comes to a couple of them. And I, I want perhaps that that superiority you know, rather than perhaps peers. Um, and I think Naomi Harris, Ben Whishaw, Ray Fiennes and Rory Kinnear and uh, Jeffrey Wright, well, obviously he doesn't need to return now. Um, my money's on Miles Teller as the next Felix Leiter. I'm just, I'm just creating a rumour, by the way. I, I just would be sad to see them go. And I, I sod continuity that they're really good performers and actors. And that's, that's something the Craig era has brought to Bond. I think we overlook that. You know, before uh, Casino Royale and before what uh, Martin Campbell and uh, particularly Sam Mendes achieved, we, we weren't attracting the likes of Javier Bardem exactly. and Albert Finney and Monica Bellucci and Helen McCrory. And, uh, you know, there was three best actor, almost three best actor winning Oscar winners coming on, coming off their Oscar to play Bond villains, you know, Bardem, Malek, Christoph Waltz. They all, you know, that, that we didn't have that era. I, I do quite still like that John Glenn uh, era of slightly unknown European actors playing yeah. you know, great side roles, but Craig, it, Craig brought, you know, the, the the era and the momentum of Daniel Craig's Bond has has shifted and changed. Absolutely, Mark. I mean, what you say in front of the camera is also behind the camera. I mean, the writing talents, yes, people like John Logan and uh, Paul Haggis and the DPs and just, just the whole panoply behind them, the depth of that new. And I have a feeling that that is what Michael and Barbara. Bulkley and Mike Wilson really want. They want to take the franchise out for a spin and use it to explore filmmaking. And they've taken more risks with the Daniel Craig era than they've ever done before. And by God, the, the franchise has, has um, uh, benefited from that. And I think also, I mean, little things like continuity, don't get me wrong, I'd love there to be continuity. There just hasn't been. And there, ha and there seems not to have been. Maybe that will change with the next iteration of the series. But quite frankly, it's compensated for all the other things that the Daniel Craig series has brought. Being a Bond fan for zillions of years, Mark and I, we love to see this franchise succeed, both critically and commercially, and also memorably. But there have become part of the zeitgeist, from Daniel Craig emerging from the ocean in his swimming trunks to the Day of the Dead sequence to Javier Bardem and the Death of M. They've become iconic film moments mm. in a way that the early films were. And I think the classicality of these Bond films 
can only be appreciated in decades time and i'm sure it will be it's well it's already there as well aj with the um i was just writing my piece on it today and how often did we see uh, snippets of the matera db5 chase throughout all global headlines about how cinema and the arts is in jeopardy has been put on hold bond became the poster boy not just for the the, the pausing of cinema but the, the pausing and concern over arts across the board you know and I, 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 I there was a famous image when the film initially first got cancelled uh and it was a it was a die another uh, it was a um, no time to die poster with uh, in china with a uh, chinese lady walking past wearing a mask and it was so and i've got that paper it was so indicative of what was about to hit the world let alone bond but bond for, i mean it was just perhaps happenstance but we I don't think we're all talking about Black Widow being the film that um, got us, you know, it was the carrot that got us through uh, COVID and lockdowns oh, God, and having no, no art, no, no, having no, no audience. <laughs> um, no, exactly, exactly. We're not, you know, no. whilst uh, Fast and Furious uh, 59 did okay, I think Bob's already doing a lot better than it. Uh, it, it, was, it was never the, the icon of, of what we didn't have, if that makes sense. And But No Time to Die has done that. And um, I... I you know, fair play. And also, one of the, the beats when we went when we were at the premiere was, you know, 5,000 people. We all had to be COVID tested just, um, uh, just you know, on that day. It wasn't about vaccines and vaccine certificates. It wasn't about, you know, uh, military grade police stop and searches. It was just about, yeah, you know, have you had a test the last 48 hours? And we were sat there and it was the first time I've been to cinema. Well, I have been going to cinema. I've been trying to see whatever I can, whenever I can. But about halfway through the film, I thought, I forgot to put my mask on and I didn't care. And I'm sorry, I say that as a personally, I just thought, right, I've been double jabbed. I've, I'm here and so are 5,000 people. And right beneath me, on, in the row beneath me, were two future kings of Britain. And if they are allowed to come along, then let's let's get the, you know, the projectors cranking up in the dark again. And I, that's what I love. I love hearing that people love the film. But I also love that people are returning to cinema and getting their just getting finding their feet and their confidence through Bond. I, I love I love the poetry of that. I mean, Mark, what you say is we you know we're at Edom on that. You know, Oliver, I know you worked in cinemas before, and you've got a love for the for the oh, auditorium, sure. and going to see a Bond movie really works. Um, you know, we I then saw the movie at the Odin Leicester Square uh, on the opening day in the evening. And there were crowds. It was raining like hell. There were crowds literally around the block. We hadn't seen that for ages. Yes. And, and the Odeon was sold out. Every screening was sold out. And it was wonderful to see that industry get saved. And as Mark says, I mean, I think Tenant last year was meant to save cinemas. Mm. Unfortunately, it didn't. And you kind of realise Bond is, at the end of the day, just fun entertainment. Your whole mm. family can go and see it. Your mum, your, your kids can see it your friends will see it. It, it. it doesn't really take much to go and see a Bond film because it's what they call four quadrant entertainment at the end of the day. And seeing cinemas that have been moribund, Mark and I love the ephemera of Bond. We love seeing the signage. We love mm. seeing cinema hoardings. London is ablaze with Bond right now. You've got the Burlington Arcade with its pop-up shops and pure Bondiana. If you haven't been, I suggest you have a sip of Bollinger and check out an Omega watch, which I can't afford. And get Make do with a Casio then, won't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a glor- it's like a glorious Bond winter grotto. I, I, I want to go back and I want to take... But you don't get to sit on Pierce Brosnan's knee and tell him what you want for Christmas, <laughs> sadly. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, but then you go to the Odeon Leicester Square. You know, London's Odeon Leicester Square is a kind of cliche for Londoners. We don't really bother with it, but you only need to see it through the eyes of all the Americans, Brazilians... Um, Greeks and uh, everyone coming to London, they they stop and look at the Odeon Leicester Square in awe and go, the Church mm. of Bond. And you've got the same film playing at the IMAX in the, what was the old um, Empire Cinema, now the Cineworld, the old View Cinema. Well, it's a View Cinema in you know, the old Warner Brothers Cinema. Bond is playing in all these screens all the time. There's massive queues. There's massive hoardings. Every cinema is playing Bond. Hopefully for a long time it will have legs. And you realise how important... Bond is to the cinema, to the arts in a bigger picture, and uh, to Bond is a clarion call, as I said before, to normality, and that's what this film is mm. proving to be with the atten- record-breaking attendances, record-breaking even pre-COVID. So you know mm. this film has outgrossed Skyfall, the highest-grossing film that, uh, so far. Uh, so that's really wonderful, and and as fans of cinema, Mark, Oliver, and me, 
we, we love to see it. The Bond has there's a bigger picture to it. There's a bigger weight to this movie. The Bond films are always always been designed, you know, for the, to watch on the biggest screen possible. And going back recently, and just seeing just the trailers at the beginning for other films, which I'd you know seen on YouTube first, and they had no really had no real effect on me. But seeing them on a big screen, it was a completely different experience. And I, for example, the Matrix trailer or something like that, which I thought was a bit kind of subpar on watching on my computer but see it on a big screen with the sound I was like this actually worked so there is a you know for them to be ballsy and say hey this is this is only going to be in the cinemas it's not going to be a digital thing because Amazon now owning MGM there could have been this kind of risky thing of saying we're going to put it on Prime in two weeks you know which they're not doing so you have to go out and see it at the cinema and I think that's the right decision Oliver, do you remember when you worked in cinemas? Do you remember showing Bond films? Were, were you? Yeah, yeah, we had Casino Royale. We, I was there for Quarter of Solace and uh, Skyfall. And was so, there an yeah. upsurge in interest? Did you feel it when a Bond film was out? Casino Royale, especially. It was um, every screen sold out. And I naively kind of went in on my day off. You know, and thought I can just go get a seat; it'd be fine. <laughs> I had to sit right at the front on the in the biggest screen. My neck was killing me, and the bass of the sound mix was just thumping through my chest. But it was still amazing to watch, even though you had to look to the far left or far right to see what was going on because it's such a you know cinema scope lens, you know format. Uh, so that was yeah, quite experience. My I took my father to see Quantum of Solace, and um, he hadn't been to, he hadn't been to the cinema since. The Mask in 1994. So, you know, it was a Bond film. He had to go see it. So, but he was, well, it's not the best Bond film. And uh, he, he just complained it was too loud. So that was, it um, never went again. That was the last <laughs> film I took my father to, because of some Bond film. And really? Loud. Oh yeah, so it was just, it was a very loud uh, kind of you know I think a clunky edited mess really, but um, it's not it's not my favourite of the of series because we had you know you had touched upon AJ about the sort of these movies aren't all I suppose kind of officially all connected you know as it were because we are talking about the long running narrative, but I think there is this I think Quantum of Solace kind of was the sort of first hiccup where they try to create this where they they were going to go with Quantum then it kind of all got squashed and changed and then come Spectre they've tried to connect all the pieces together um, which you know the fans have sort of highlighted as being a bit of a clumsy manoeuvre at the end when he sees all the pictures on the wall and, and so forth yeah. and is it clumsy though because I I've mm. had this realisation recently that um, Bond often gets uh, uh, sort of uh, looked at for alright so Moonraker was a response to Star Wars yes. and it was, actually it was more of a response to youth going to big cinema as well uh, and obviously, you know, the, the kung fu effect of, um, of Bruce Lee feeding into Golden Gun. And then you could, you could say Octopussy has echoes of that colonial Indiana Jones era of adventure. Mm. And yes, you can say that Quantum Solace, Casino Royale were influenced possibly by Bourne. But I think what actually is really, really influencing the five Craig films is this era of arcs and almost binge box set, uh, binge watching mm. box sets. I mean this, um, that we we have in the last i don't know eight ten years we have audiences have grown to appreciate and expect the big narrative project yes. so we will what you know and it, i kind of started with harry potter uh you know where there's seven films yes they were based on a sequence of books i think the marvel films go too far into are oh, you wait this will all be explained in three films time and i'm like well I've paid money to watch this film. I want it to be a, I want it to be a film, not a uh, Comic-Con <laughs> trade, you know, uh, trade ad. But I, I feel that this whole idea of art was, and I, I, I remember watching Quantum of Solace and the, the Tosca scenes in Austria, particularly thinking, oh my God, they finally got that spectre motif without mm. fully appreciating that that's what they, it literally was that. And yes, it may have been done in hindsight. Uh, they call it retconning where you go back and uh, retrofit the continuity of the film. But it's what, all of our movies are doing right now. I happen to know that Mission Impossible 7 and 8 are going to do a similar sweep through the their own uh, registry of chapters. Yeah, I, oh, are they? I, it oh. is not, yeah, it's not unknown. Uh, and I think that's where the Craig era, it's, everyone says, oh, what did uh, the Craig era emulate? It, it's not Bourne, that's, that's lazy, because actually Bourne's emulating what Peter Hunt and Bob Simmons and the stunt crews and the DNA of action cinema that Bond created 
uh, in the 60s. That, that's what Bourne was just aping. Bourne was aping Bond. It wasn't, it wasn't the other way around. Um, so I think, yeah, we need, uh, if we take a step back and not worry about the art. Yes, I, I love a standalone Bond film, but AJ's right. This is a standalone Bond film in as much as it's also linked to all the others. Oliver, you mentioned the point about the attempt to sort of sequelize uh, uh, Quantum of Solace. Yeah, there's a there's a vague hint of you know oh Vesper he's 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 mourning Vesper's death, but really no story elements come through. You don't really need to have seen that. It's conveyed nicely in a picture. Skyfall completely eschews everything, and it's 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 very much its own thing. And then Spectre sort of retrofits it, but you don't really need to. It's very much its own story. Um, I think there's a gap between publicity and what the film actually is. So the longest time, Bond films are said mm. to have been influenced from following trends. Actually, if you look carefully, they don't really. Firstly, they're a genre unto themselves. Secondly, um, things like The Man with the Gone Gun, it notionally dips into the Kung Fu arts, but it tells a quite an, a sophisticated eco-thriller story that has nothing to do with Bruce Lee or Kung Fu. Bond has it in one scene, and arguably, you could argue that comes from the only of twice, which predates all those films. By the time Bond is in Moonraker, and we talk about Star Wars, and it's obviously influenced by uh, the going Bond going to space is made possible by Star Wars. Actually, the movie is far more Kubrickian and owes a lot more to 2001 and treats its space themes not as space opera, but as Cubby Broccoli said, uh, science fa facts, not science fiction. Um, throughout the two years, we've had there was one moment of John Woo-ness in Tomorrow Never Dies with Michelle Yeoh firing two machine guns. But again, if you look at, if you know your cinema history, John Woo was inspired by Sam Peckinpah and Sam Peckinpah's editing. And Sam, Sam Peckinpah's editor was Roger Slottersworth, the director of Tomorrow Never Dies. So they kind of pay lip service. There's a bit of diehardness in, uh, in License to Kill from the music Michael came and some of the casting, the American set. Yes. But it doesn't yeah. feel like a diehard movie. Bond, Bond's worldview is always international. He's from the inside looking out. And it's the only story in the film series where it turns on Bond being British. The plot can't happen unless he's British. And subsequently, with, with I mean, there's the Bourne films, as Mark has already said, the, the high-octane, high-cut action sort of has its roots in Peter Hunt's editing of the early Bond movies, especially Majesty's Secret Service, edited by John Glenn. So the, the, but Bond, Bond does follow or take notes from what's contemporary. But again, in Casino Royale, it has a 45-minute casino gambling sequence where all sat at chairs. That's the bravery of it. As a, it, it it's very much its own beast. Mm. And as they talk about car chases, only Bond would then take an Aston Martin through the marble quarry pits of Carrera in Quantum of Solace. It, it's sort of Dan Bradley, who was the second unit director on the, um, on the Bourne movies, or the Paul Greengrass Bourne movies, then took over that. And yes, of course, it has Bourne-esque elements, but the story and the worldview is very much international, very much Bond. And, and now we don't talk about Bourne. Now we don't talk about... I, I think Sam Mendes is, says he owes a debt of gratitude to Christopher Nolan's uh, The Dark Knight for um, some of the action and structure of Skyfall. But no one will look at Skyfall oh, yeah. and go, that is The Dark Knight. It's very much its own British, very kind of, uh, meta text on what it means to be British, what it means to be Bond in the Jubilee year, in the Jubilee year of Bond. And The Dark Knight has none of that. So, it, you know, Bond does nod and borrow, but it, it tends to be very much its own thing because first and foremost, it's its own genre. Now with the new villain, Safin, played by Rami Malek, do you chaps think he lives up to the standard of previous Bond villains or feels somewhat underwritten? Well, some of the reviews I've I've read and and heard that he, he seems to be the sort of the main sort of issue with the film um, that I think he doesn't have enough screen time uh, come the end when he has to reveal his kind of master plan and his confrontation with Bond. I feel um, that they kind of slightly, slightly somewhere along the process, the the thunderball was dropped on uh, on uh, Safin and Rami Malek. I love that he's in the film. It made total sense. And he, his stillness of speech and character is unnerving, as it absolutely should be. Yeah. I do, I do feel the film, and this is perhaps me and my John Glenn era classicism when it comes to Bond movie watching, I do feel the film 
misses just slightly, misses that trail of gold, those trail of diamonds or microchips or Fabergé eggs or stolen warheads or stolen satellites. It, it misses that sort of stepping stone narrative. You know, the, 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 the villain procuring his evil plan is, is immediately as we come out of the opening titles into that. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in a brilliant sequence, actually. I love the whole sequence of the use of magnets and um, Hugh Dennis uh, looking sciencey in a science lab coat. I love, I love all that. Um, but I, I, I feel they dropped the ball a bit. And I, you know, you've, the, uh, the Garden of Death from the Only Live Twice novel is one of the untapped glories of Fleming. And I've always, always wanted it. And so it seems did Purvis and Wade, the writers or co-writers, they wanted to bring that element in. And I just felt where was, for example, now, now, we, now we're talking about it. It's actually really nice to be talking to people about it now that it's out there as well. Um, so please don't listen to this, whatever, 27 minutes in if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> but I, when Bond is at Madeline's uh, grave side in Matera on the hill in a beautiful sort of Godfather aware sequence, yeah. and there's a bouquet of slightly dried flowers there. I would have had them taken away and realised that there's some weird poisonous flowers, some rare flowers that, you know, I, I would have had Bond start to trail that when we have Safin in Madeline Swan's therapy office talking about foxgloves and how if you eat them, they'll, they'll stop your heart immediately. I'm like, well, where was the payoff of that? Well, I, I get why Bond just shoots Safin twice in the, in, you know, in the head quickly. And I get that actually this is not about the death of the villain. This is about the death of Bond. So they have to kind of pull back. But I wanted to see more sort of cause and effect. I, I felt the... Um, the poison garden just could have been a little bit more. It could have been a garden. It could have just done a bit more and take that sense of poison and horticulture that is in the books and that Safin does allude to. Um, but we again, we spend, it's a bit like the Blofeld Waltz syndrome. We spend too much time looking at old family photos and trying to understand the, the motive rather than to be presented with the plot. Yeah. And I think that's where the film just slightly tripped for me. I love Malik in it. Uh, as I say, I think it was a perfect choice. But I just feel, I just wanted to see more sadism on his part. I, he kind of he inherits other people's slightly sick and gloriously twisted henchmen. He doesn't really have any of his own. So, and I, maybe that was perhaps, you know, the, the, the film did go through different... Uh, iterations of writers and indeed directors and maybe that was something that's got slightly lost in the uh, the pudding as they say. Mark I love your observation about the Bond films usually have some sort of wonderful Fleming-esque a tip of the tentacle of Fabergé egg or a cello that leads you into the bigger spy narrative mm. I think mm. that's a really good observation about Safin. I think the problem firstly I really love Rami Malek as Safin the casting was great the, the weight and the heat and the modernity he brought to the role. I think that's part of the update of the Bond mythos. They always take the freshest, youngest, best sort of uh, roles that really capture the zeitgeist. So him and Lashana Lynch and um, uh, Anna de Armas really say 2021 or our times. Um, Safin's role, they obviously went big with this. He's obviously the Bond villain from the beginning. I like his look. Mm. I think that those horror beats in the beginning Oh, Norm, where really scary, the no mask that, that becomes a symbol of his character. Um, it, I love the appearance in, uh, in Madeline Smith's psychiatrist's office as a client. We see that lovely plot point of him saving a piece of her hair from which he'll extract the poison from her DNA. I think that Safin's presence throughout the movie, even in the forest scenes where Bond, uh, where he managed to kidnap Safin and, and Mathilde, Bond's daughter, um, were really sinister mm. and then a bomb villain with his base with his scheme uh, of course drawn from as mark said ian fleming's you only have twice where in that story blofeld has an organic garden of death with all sorts of poisonous flowers which facilitates people to commit suicide in japan which the japanese government then tasked bond with killing Blofeld and closing down the Garden of Death because it's a national embarrassment. There's a wonderful chapter in the Fleming book where he outlines all the poisonous flowers and it's called Slay It With Flowers. Mm. I always thought it would be a good Bond title. All of this is brilliant. The problem, I think, with Safin, like a lot of Bond villain plots, is you don't have that mint julep moment. You don't have that wonderful bit of exposition where the villain says, this is what I'm doing, this is the effect of it, and this mm. is what it means on the world. When Blofeld says, I'm going to not steal the gold, I'm going to irradiate it 
my value will go up 57 times and I'm going to cause economic meltdown in the West. In one scene, casually with Bond, the stakes are raised and that scene must usually appear halfway through the movie, not in the middle of it. So Safin has taken over Waldo's, Heracles project, the poisonous project that began with M 10 years ago and has managed to refine it to his own ends and make it um, basically, instead of being a targeted attack of assassination where only one person you could gas a whole village but target only one terrorist the whole point of Safin he's now made it he's weaponized it to target multiple people and multiple targets multiple ethnicities and the implication is that once he's sort of irradiated the world with it he can play god and choose to have eradicate ethnicities or countries or people and presumably hold the world to ransom with this power once it's been spread. Of course, none of this is explained and none of this is really exposited. And I think had that been done, so all Sapin's creepiness, all his oddness would have played into the bigger plot, would have answered, ah, oh, that's what he's doing. And I think that helps a Bond villain. It's confusing in the storytelling. I suspect something was edited. I believe in the pre-title sequence, when, when um, young Madeline shoots Safin in the heart, uh, we don't know how he survives. There may be body armour behind that. I believe there was a point where they took an element from the novel of Dr. No, where B B Dr. No was shot in the heart, but survived because he's one person in the world, in a million, who has his heart on the wrong side. And I think that was the idea for Safin as well. Again, a great hmm. Bondian trait drawn from Fleming. But once again, they don't explain or tell you that. And similarly with the story, it needed, I think, a little bit of the mint julep momentness of it all, which the current films tend to rarely do. But yeah, I, I loved him as a villain. I loved him as a piece of casting. I think he'll go down as classic. I'm pretty sure his costumes, again, Mark alluded to the costumes, which are wonderful. There's some great moments where you've got um, Safin sort of Japanese background costumes, but you've even got the small bits in, in the lab with Hugh Dennis in. You've got red lab coats, and if you look in the distance, there's yellow lab coats. They're sort of uh, homage to previous Bond. And again, with something we've never seen, I think the costume designer, which I believe was a Danny Boyle hire, mm -hmm. has done a wonderful job. I, I, I totally agree with you guys. I, I think Rami's a you know he provides a wonderful performance and great delivery with his with his dialogue and i and i adore the confrontation between him and bond i think it's one of the moments where craig has the most dialogue i think in in the films where he actually he's always been how he's written it's kind of a it's kind of short and to the point when he talks and for him to have a sort of face to face with the bad guy and not not just be a kind of a short kind of sequence where he gets taken out by you know, by the villains kind of thugs or things that's cut short in general I think the whole sequence really kind of played up to kind of Craig's interpretation of the character and I think delivered one of his best performances I think the whole movie contains one of his uh, best performances of the series I, I, I agree on that I, I do think it's Craig's best performance I, I don't want to sort of pour old martini on Casino Royale or Skyfall but there's there's, there's even just there's just a moment right at the beginning of the film where Bond and Madeline are arriving at their Matera hotel and she's ribbing him about stop looking over your shoulder and he goes I'm not and there was just a lightness and a, a humanity that he brings to this role and it's there yes it's there when he's peeling an apple for for who he's peeling an apple for we'll get there in a minute I'm sure but I I genuinely feel this is Craig's best the spin of the Bond dice and maybe he slightly like that like diamonds are forever i think it's probably one of connery's best bond films because he he knows it was his last he was you know make it the best and you don't have that pressure of doing another one and i, I think maybe that that fed into craig's there is a lightness of touch in particularly the cuba scenes as well he's 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 grinning and laughing and smirking as as all all the cuban chaos is breaking out and i i, I yeah i would say it's possibly his best performance because yeah, because from the very beginning, you know, we've had Craig's set out to do a new version of Bond. Um, what do you guys kind of think he's brought to the table to sort of enhance the character, or or do you think someone something's been somewhat lost in the interpretation compared to the others because they have tried to in, interject a lot of humour into the character, especially for this one. I think down to um, obviously uh, Phoebe Waller. Bridge kind of being involved. I think with Daniel Craig from the get-go of Casino Royale, what he's done is he's he's made a very naturalistic performance. He plays scenes out. 
these given scenes mm. to play. You're right, the short quippery of the Bond before was allowed to extend itself in the in the in the train scene and casino role in the in the in the bedroom and bathroom scene and casino role. And I think that's brought to fruition in this picture. And you're right, Oliver. I think they've made this a very funny, witty Bond film. And I'm pretty sure they were heading that way mm. in Spectre, which is one of the reasons I enjoyed Spectre. I know we're not supposed to. I felt it was going yeah. a much more Bondian way. And this one is very witty, very funny, and they're allowed to play out a whole scene, both with Bond, with Nomi, the scenes with M and Crackle. Um, and and they, they, they are, there's great scene structure. You set up a joke uh, or a, and in the dialogue, in the playing of it, you then pay it off. And I think Daniel Craig, you're right, he's got long bits of verbiage to say with Safin. And they do have an exchange of philosophies, which again is... The drawn... Yeah, which I, I I really loved that moment. I thought it was really good. Yeah, that's drawn from, I pretty much saw in the Fleming books. And you'll find that um, a lot of this has the spirit of Ian Fleming, if not the truth of it. And I think this just allows Daniel Craig to place his strengths. I remember before Daniel Craig was officially cast, I'm, I, I was aware he was in the offing and I knew someone that had the test screenings and I asked them, you know, without making them give anything away, what what he thought of the screen. And basically he said, Daniel Craig came in so as an original. He wasn't copying anyone. It was very much his own Bond. And I think going beyond this Bond, the next actor will be a complete reaction to Daniel mm. Craig. But Daniel Craig has brought this realistic, natural playing and humanisation. Plus he's been given that to play with by the writers and directors. Remember, this isn't all all about Daniel Craig. Roger Moore once said he was the jewel in, he was the gemstone in set in the jewel of James Bond machinery. And I think the writers, the often uh, negated writers, Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, this is their seventh Bond film. I think the roots of this can be seen in World Is Not Enough, where they're playing with structures, they're playing with the form, they're slowly trying to make something of the unique structure of a bond film and i i ideally i think daniel craig has the dalton dna i was about to say that yeah because there's a lot of dalton in him you know with the serious so. direction and tone and if only dalton had been given the freedom and license to kill to yeah. do this I, I was lucky enough to read the third dalton script by william osborne and william davis which has all the elements of golden eyes skyfall in it the roots of those movies or in that what would have been a wonderful third Dalton movie, which captures the pithy humour and really would have worked for Dalton. Anyway, that wasn't to be. But I think Daniel Craig is standing on the shoulders of what slowly is an evolution of writing and conceiving what a Bond film can be. Mm. But arguably, and I think Mark will agree with this, if you'd presented this script in 1986 to the Bond people, they'd have thrown you out the window. Oh, but yeah. now... Yeah. Now it's very much an acceptable version of Bond. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so, yeah, we've obviously both alluded to, all of us have alluded to, the sort of big surprise plot elements of the movie with Ozzy Bond dying. But we are introduced to Bond's daughter. I suppose the first big shock before that was the death of Felix Leiter, who's, um, you know, been injured and stuff throughout the series. But uh, to have him be killed off was, a, to me, it was actually quite an emotional moment. It's, it's the one time where Bond has actually cared about someone who's in the same sort of profession as him uh, to sort of, you know be lost but him having a daughter as well was a sort of a at, at first I was a little bit like oh it's all a bit of a trick I, it's definitely his daughter and then at the, and at the end it's like it's clearly revealed it, it is his daughter and were you guys sort of surprised by the introduction and the uh, the death of Felix Leiter? Um, I had no problem with the daughter. It, it is done extremely effectively. I, I think the fact that she's French immediately saves it. So we don't have this mm. annoying sort of South London stage school starlet <laughs> you know, overdubbed by a 40-year-old woman like Nancy Cartwright and Bart Simpson, which is still a creepy thing that loads of British films used to do in the 70s and 80s have adult women voicing <laughs> children. Uh, it did, yeah, it we did, don't have really. that here. And the, I mean, the, the kid is beautiful, very photogenic responds brilliantly to Lea Sadu. I mean, the, I think the, for me personally, the casting and the chemistry between mother and daughter in the film is what makes it, what, it, what makes me buy it because it is just done very carefully and subtly. It is, you know, and, and you know, it, it makes total sense that, that Bond would have a, you know, after you know, 25 uh, movies of shagging, of course he's got a child. And yes, it's alluded to, 
uh, one of the novels, um, and then Raymond Benson picks it up later, one of his short stories, and really goes there. And I, I just love the final moment where Nurse to do at the end says, I want to tell you a story. It's about a man called Bond, James Bond, and the daughter just smiles very mm. carefully. You know, they, that, that girl didn't know she was making movies, and that's why it works. Uh, and I, I, I have zero problem with it. It's Craig makes it work. I don't quite... Could you imagine maybe Roger Moore or even Dalton having a daughter of that age in a bond? I don't, maybe, just don't think it works, but um, it does with um, young, young Matilde. I know one or two Bond fans um, just by chance have, have got daughters called Matilda and their wives are not happy because they just assume they had insight. Going, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> um, I think that the, the reveal of Matilda being Bond's daughter sort of goes to my initial discombobulation because mm. even the return of Leia Sadu as the Bond girl, they all feel like so property tropes. Um, it feels manipulative initially because you've got to have an instant care for a character that's not part of the series. Yes. And Bond, it, it, of course, Bond's daughter, Bond, at the end of the novel Yoniv Twice, it's revealed that Kissy Suzuki is pregnant with Bond's child. And in uh, John Pearson's fictionalised biography of 007, written in this 73, they reveal the child to be James Suzuki. Uh, a character who, Jay, who Raymond Benson keeps up with in his first Bond short story, Blast from the Past, who unfortunately dies off screen, so to speak. It turns out that the child of Bond was now a character owned by the Dan Jack series, so only they could have Bond's children and eventually have this. This was a notion that had been toyed with before, however. In Quantum of Solace, the original screenplay has Vesper's child be found by Bond in an orphanage. And they've, they've wanted to have this sort of notion before in Bond films. And here is come to full circle. I think the execution of it overcomes the, the soap opera structure of it. I think, as Mark says, the wonderful actress playing uh, Mathilde is terrific. We've never had this sort of relationship in a Bond movie before. That's a trope of other movies. It could be, you know, every Liam Neeson movie has his daughter in peril. <laughs> Here in this picture, and the way it's done with quite sophistication and quite, and it thematically it works about family, about blood, about bonds, literally. That's the other clever thing about how it's seeded in to the story. And that's what I particularly like about how it was. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been there in plain sight all along. We, we've been told about Bond being you know, being made an orphan, being taken in, surrogate parents, even Camille, uh, you know, even Safin in this film. But the whole idea of being damaged children is quite a theme of the Daniel Craig films. And here there's a child who Bond has, has the ability or that little brief window of time to make sure they're not damaged, to make sure they don't become a Bond villain. And, and if it's peeling an apple and leaving a Jim Henson breakfast TV moment on, that's how they do it. And I, 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 just, I, I didn't think it was... I didn't think it was gimmicky. I didn't think it was soapy or, you know, I, I mean, Fleming himself got completely bowled over by the birth of his own son. The whole idea of the reason we have Bond films are because Cubby Broccoli had his own daughter and, and uh, stepson that took things on. So the, the idea of families and offspring is actually vital to the Bond's, uh, dare I say it, DNA. It, I agree with you. Uh, and let's shout out the girl who plays uh, Bond, Matilde, Lisa Dora Sonne. Um, th th I agree with you, but you can't build a brand over 60 years. This, this is a new element to that brand. I agree. It's been hiding in same plain sight. And of course, the whole Eon family, the whole thing is based around family. I always have a laugh. I always listen to press conferences or uh, what Daniel Craig says about this film and imagine Roger Moore or Timothy Dalton or Sean Connery saying it. Uh, because the, the beast of a Bond film has moved on so much. But ultimately, does it work in the film? Absolutely. Does it create an extra dimension to it that Bond films don't have? Absolutely. And again, it's what it's the unique thing about No Time to Die. What makes it particularly emotionally powerful is this undertow and this depth that, that is hinted at, as we've all talked about, but we've never really seen in a Bond movie before. We do, you know, we do see that scene where uh, James finds his daughter's like little toy or stuffed 
Is it a bunny rabbit? I think it was. Two hundred pounds on on double oh seven store by Christmas. I'll tell you <laughs> doo-doo. I want a doo doo. I want a doo doo for Christmas. Because obviously, when, when he grabs the 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 stuffed toy, and it's sort of, I thought to myself that okay, Bond is gonna be able to escape, but obviously now he is poisoned at this point, and we do see him eventually die. Um, I suppose him being poisoned um, and being unable to sort of be with. Uh, Madeline is I suppose, I suppose it could be a bit on the nose sort of metaphor that Bond is somewhat poisonous to others around him and I think mm-hmm. you know it was definitely a ballsy move to kill him off and it and it had shocked uh, a lot of my friends who went into it thing saying they, they all loved it until the very end and I was like well you know I think if they hadn't killed him off and it was just like the ending of Spectre where he's in the V8 and he's with his daughter and uh, Madeline and off in off off into the sunset and a happy ending it would be somewhat playing it way too safe where where the Bond producers had played it safe a number of times in the past because it's just like you know to get the box office in and um and make sure everything kind of runs smoothly where sometimes they they do be they, they take a risk and it's not quite what people wanted and then over over the years people go oh my god that film was amazing why do they change it you know change things come the next one you know very much like with Lazenby you know then come the next film they go back to Sean Connery and and um with License to Kill which just kind of went a bit too hard-edged for many people um but I think the idea of killing Bond was was a good move but it's uh it's not it's not going to please everyone you know they could have killed him in a different way they could have killed him ambiguously so he could have collapsed on that tower you see the explosions all around him we still play. I think the definitive explosive hit is problematic, I think, in narrative terms. Having said that, it must be intensely satisfying for most people. I think you could have had him die and not die, exactly like in the books, personally, and it wouldn't have affected the emotional impact. Mm. But that's just me, and that's some Bond fans. Uh, ultimately, though, I've seen it with so many people who love that finality, and there is a kind of symmetry with the Daniel Craig era. There were other ways they could have done it, perhaps should have done it, but who am I to go blow against the wind? They've, <laughs> they've done what they've done. No, I don't, I don't, I've, I've got zero problems with that, that moment because I think it's become the impactful, it's actually going to be really good for box office because, you know, the, the, the spectre cat is out of the bag in terms of how No Time to Die ends. And I actually think that's pulling more people into the cinemas than not. Uh, and I think it's a very impactful moment. I I kind of don't mind it's Hans Zimmer stroke Mazzaro uh, Avengers Assemble <laughs> Death of Iron Man sort of sense of cinema gravitas. Um, I, all I need to see is Q just you know uh, sat in his pajamas and his uh, crash helmet suddenly clicking what's happened, and I just I, I lose it at that point at that moment. Um, so no, I agree that we could have had a little caveat, a little hints, a little red herring as to what happened. Also, we haven't discussed a new 007 agent uh, in No Time to Die because there was a lot of, you know, hoopla about having a female 007. But after watching the film, I wasn't particularly impressed with the character and how she's written. They do make a fuss about, you know, I think they're just there for the fans to see how you know, they can wind them up. Um, with She's called 007 and she's concerned if what what James is going to be, what double O he's going to be. Then I, and then she gives him the 007, you know, name at the end. And it, it would have been nice to have had them kind of work together. Well, they do at the end, but there's not, there's no great banter between them. There's no sort of, I would have liked some sort of like buddy cop kind of like dialogue where there is funny quips there or there's no moment for them to really sort of build a sort of friendship. Which All we get is them having some sort of mutual respect for each other by the end. Um, but yeah, it wasn't the best introduction of a new 007. I think probably Halle Berry probably made a better impression on me in Die Another Day, which is not a particularly good film, but I think she'd, uh, you know, made more of an impact, I think. I think when people talk about strong female characters in Bond films, it's become a bit cliche and people tend to roll their mm. eyes. I, I sometimes think people don't quite get what that means there. They're talking about characters that have agency, that have their own story, that work outside Bond. And in terms of that, that happens very rarely. Nomu, played by Lashana Lynch, obviously is one of the zeitgeistian elements of this movie. 
the diff diversity of the of MI6 and the diversity of people playing these characters is that this is what the lightning rod of this character is. But I think she works really well. We see her in Jamaica, where she's a, a, a girl on the trail of Bond. She she disables his car. She tracks him down. She plays Jamaican and then you know reveals herself to be a well-spoken new double O agent, then double O seven. I think it's a way of the movie series having its cake and eating it. It obviously plays to current concerns, which Bond films tend to do. Um, and then at the end, it all gets resolved. I think the dynamic is really good. I like the fact she has a separate story trail. She's on the trail of Ash. I think sequences in Cuba, where she's working with and against Bond. And then at the end in, in uh, the Poison Garden, uh, the Poison Island, I think she works really well. But ultimately, it is always going to be a secondary character. It's not going to be James Bond. And the use of 007, mm. uh, I don't really mind whether she's 007 or not. I think mm. it was a little bit sort of weak where she hands it back voluntarily. I might have liked to see her yeah. maybe die heroically at the end with Bond. That would have been a good way of, of, of celebrating it. But then, you know, there are problems on its own. But I think she's wonderfully played by Lashana Lynch, who gives it a spirit and an edge. And I like the fact that um, she fits in perfectly well. I like that little bit of dialogue between her and Naomi Harris. And quite frankly, it I think it it only it problematizes certain types of people. I think generally a lot more has been made of it than it is. You know, last time for Spectre, they made great play of Monica Bellucci being the 50-year-old Bond woman, how Bond moves the dial forward. We don't see any of that in this movie. So next time, you know, they 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 throw sop to the current zeitgeist in moments. Um, I, I love the line as a, as a reaction to this, where Felix Light or Bond calls Ash Logan, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Billy Magnuson. Uh, what, yeah. what about Book of Mormon there? I think that was a nice yeah, yeah. point as well. But generally, <laughs> I think, personally, I, re I thought it was much better cast and employed than, it, than a female agent normally does. And the, hap the fact she happens to be black and happens to be dubbed seven is irrelevant, really, in the greater scheme of things. We have had another female double agent, double O agent before, haven't we? Like, a, is it Thunderball? There's one we see pop up. Well, there physically is, and also in the world with enough. But the, the difference is, people say that, but the problem is, they need to occupy screen time and do something. Yeah, you know, I mean, after all, look at Triple X, Anya Amasova. She was a great agent, but she never had her own story thread. She never had her own motivation apart from killing James Bond. Jinx, I think, was highly successful. Michelle Rose Waylin was good. But I think the one of the best characters of all was Diana Riggs Tracy, who, without being an agent, without being anything, had her own story, her own screen time, her own resonance, played wonderfully by the late Dame Diana Riggs. So sometimes it's not the character per se, it's the writing and the actress playing it. Yeah, I, I think Lashana Lynch will be one of the, the breakout stars of this film. I think she's she's already doing a good good thing. She's got another film coming up this year or early next year now with um, the Barbara Broccoli produced based on a Royal Court stage play called Ear for Eye um, that I think presumably is where uh, the House of Broccoli first noticed Lynch. I like, I love her poise when she's first in Jamaica and she she says she's a diving girl, which is, you know, it's so sort of Connery 60s Bond DNA for starters. Um, and if you know if it if it ruffled if, if having a British woman is ca casting a bond for ruffles feathers then let let those uh, let, you know let those guy let those gammons have their pineapple because <laughs> it's just it's it's a, it's redundant. But bond is this is not new for Bond. It's not it's this is not a woke Bond film. I hate that phrase in itself, but it is not a. I woke, don't think it is. No, so, if it's a woke no. Bond film, then so is Doctor No for featuring various women of different backgrounds. Um, in very often you know. From the get-go in the 60s, the Bond girls weren't just bikini-clad eye candy. Yes, that was a factor, but then it was also a factor that Connery was chestless with his rack out as well all the time. That also gets <laughs> overlooked in the feminist uh, looks at these films. But these women in the 60s uh, from different cultural backgrounds were in were head of spectre, were were chief, you know, chief hench bitch. Chief, they were they were in high powered jobs. They weren't just arm candy in a way that action cinema and possibly a lot of cinema in the 60s wasn't doing so you know Lashana Lynch is not some new woke tangent she's just another in a line of cannily cast women put on you know put into the Bond um, timeline 
Absolutely. And I think Mark makes a great point about Bond films have always done this. If we if we're on the diversity trail from from the very beginning, you had Turkish Bond women, you had Oriental Bond women, uh, leading roles in the in the franchise. Um, and Lashana Lynch inherits that long line of it. Entertaining, witty, funny. She's got some great lines. She plays them well. She looks great. And as Mark says, she's, she's been a wonderful icon in the publicity and, mm. and comes across extremely well. I hope she has a long career ahead of her. And I think that the Bond women of, of, of recent, I think it's really important that Bond does have strong women because it makes him better. When we've had slightly weaker Bond women, it sort of affects the movie. But I think it's great. And I don't think it's a, it's a problem to have that in a movie, in a contemporary movie. Also, the Bond women are much more memorable than their contemporaries in other franchises. There are multiple roles, different sides of femininity in these movies, mm. from Money Penny to M to, um, to, to, to the supporting characters to the villains. As an actress, to have roles for women, let alone, of course, behind the camera, from Barbara Rockley to the costume designer to Phoebe Waller Bridge mm. writing, again, the depth of which has always been done. The first Bond film. Was the first screenplay writer was Joanna Harwood. Uh, Cubby Broccoli's wife, Dana Broccoli, did lots of un- uncredited rewrites from the screenplays and casting. So there's this through line of the female gaze, as Mark would say, on, you know, that's why you get Sean Connery, Timothy Dalton, Daniel Craig. That's why a huge part of a bond and their success is his appeal to women. And Daniel Craig, I think, has found a great new audience with a, an untapped market. In a in a in a real resonant way that that they genuinely believe his emotional depth and his care and his cruelty and brutality as well. Mm. Yeah, one of the beats. Uh, it's, it's not even a beat. It's not even a tick. It's like a slither and a, a half a second in time. Um, Q's preparing roast potatoes for a dinner date when Bond and Money Penny pile round and crack open his red wine, and he he, right. he drops a hint about oh look he's going to be here in twenty minutes. And it, it confirms what a lot of you know a lot of us suspected from the from that National Gallery bench in Skyfall onwards that oh you know as soon as Q said I've got two cats and love Earl Grey tea it's like mm, okay and now now the character is gay it, it is not made there, there's no spotlights put on it there's no flags there's no hashtags to it it is just who it is it's slightly honouring that Ben Whishaw the actor is gay as well not that that mattered but it it's just it just shows that actually you know it's as perhaps Bond films might still want to be set in 1978, but the world isn't. And I, I, I love that it just moves on. You know, Bond's doing its thing. Perhaps it's more ahead of the curve than some of the audience is going to watch it. And, and those that fear the wokery of James Bond, should we, and I think that's a term none of us really like, should be very, very, very satisfied that M is still a white middle-class man, Ray Fiennes, Gareth Mallory. Tanner is Rory Kinnear. They're still... There's still representation for mm. for white straight mm. males, you know, which is important. <laughs> and you know, I know that demographic has not been catered to by Bond films, but we phone in the token white male for for people. There. And, and we're making a joke. I think, but because Bond films are so important, lots of cultural mm. weight gets put on their shoulders. Bond is a lightning rod for these discussions. Whenever I am asked, and I happen to be of Asian background, should Bond be diverse? I say no. I think when you ask that question, what you really mean is, should there be more inclusivity behind and in front of the camera in the movie and entertainment industry? Of course. And that's a job yes. that people need to do and think about, which is being done generally. But Bond ultimately is not a social justice warrior. It's a very commercially um, uh, lucrative brand. And you don't turn a Coke can blue. And that's mm. what the thing is. You can you can pay lip service to all that. But People also don't want to see a Coke can blue. They want to see the brand they've spent 60 years establishing. And I think when you look at the surrounding cast and everything, they have evolved and attitudes have evolved. But Bond is ultimately a fantasy adventure movie. And it's not meant to be. It's a wonderful social commentary, the technology, the threats, the fears. The, the role of women, the role of minorities and other people like that. Um, uh, in, in that third Dalton screenplay, Bond has a gay assistant called Jennings, who is very camp and very funny, and it's very on the nose, which you know was their attempt at inclusivity. One of the great things about the casting of Naomi Harris, 
uh, of Ben Wishaw and and uh, Ray Fiennes is how subtly and how wonderfully well acted they are and how well written they are. There are so many cliches all those people would fall into and they fall into none of them. And Mark's uh, pointing out of that dinner sequence, which again, I don't think confirms he's gay or not. It just says he's got a male friend. Coming oh, he's got, he's got a grinder hookup. <laughs> he's, he's got all the apps. Q probably created grinder. It's probably his app. He probably did. You know, yes. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what that is. He's just being polite, making dinner. He's not I'll, like I'll tell you, I'll tell you a nice Ben Wishaw story. I happened to meet him in a pub in London and he was talking to a very attractive woman and uh, a friend of mine from uh, abroad, thought that I'll was scratch your eyes out already thought, thought that was his girlfriend <laughs> anyway we didn't want to bother him but these chaps were from a rural day they eventually went up and said hello to him introduced themselves I'm ex from Tulsa I'm ex from Sweden I'm ex from uh, uh, Greece and that was it and then when we left about 20 minutes later he stopped us and remembered their names and said bye hope you enjoy your time in London it showed how what a lovely guy he was you know wow it was just a sweet story. sweet little story you know mm. well chaps one final question which is one you've probably been asked many times before and, and especially recently so where do you think the franchise is going to go now do you think the producers will sort of go with another sort of sort of origin type story or go straight into a james bond film where he's already established and being sent out on a mission where does James Bond go from here? Well, let's look at this slightly seriously from the industry point of view. MGM has just been bought over by Amazon. MGM own 50% of the shares in the Bond copyright holding company, Danja LLC. They're the corporate partners of Bond. By the way, those who fear Bond is going to be sucked up by Amazon should know that Bond has been co-owned since 1975 by a big major corporation. So nothing's really going to change there. Ownership and control are different. Dan Jack is controlled very strongly by Michael Wilson and Barbara Broccoli. Um, Michael's youngest son, Greg Wilson, is going to be, I think, the heir apparent to partner with Barbara, and Michael will still be in charge. Um, I think the way Dan Jack and Eon are using Bond is great. In this period, they've, their non-Bond productions from plays and other movies and TV has been hugely um, productive and I think they are using the weight of Bond to fund and make other things so I think Bond will continue under their auspices what will Bond be I think in the new age we're going to get a Bond film sooner rather than later I predict 2024 because Amazon want their money back they spent a lot of money and I think the stymieing of Bond's productivity has been the financial insecurity of MGM uh, Bond 23, Skyfall, was supposed to come out in 2010. Spectre was supposed to be made back to back with its other movies. The only reason it wasn't done because the funding from MGM has been precarious. Now, they hopefully, they'll be well funded. I think people will sit down and say, give us an arc of four films. We'll recast Bond. We're going to have someone youngish, more traditionally cast, more entertaining. I think it will be a reaction towards Daniel Craig. As to who that Bond will be, I have no idea. Um, they'll have the Goldilocks quality, i.e. they won't be too famous, too big a star. They won't be too unknown, too experienced. They'll have just the right amount of fame, just the right amount of experience and stardom, the Goldilocks amount. I think they've been working in plain sight. I think we've seen them. We know who they are. We just don't know what to actually think of them as James Bond. Names I would throw out, the obvious Henry Cavill, ex-Superman, I think probably not anymore. People like Nicholas Holt, Jack Loudon, Max Irons, Ed Screen, all these are good, solid, handsome British working actors in their early 30s that will be signed to series, usually three pictures plus one, the producer's option, and let's see. And then, and only then, once you've established a new Bond, maybe every two or three films, will you maybe have certain spin-offs, which have been denied by, you'll have, you know, they'll take the series out for full exploitation, I think. Um, the Fleming, Ian Fleming publications, the literary copywriters, have done this already with continuation novels, with Charlie Higson and Steve Kell's wonderful Young Bond books, Samantha Weinberg's Money Penny series. You've had uh, John Pearson's fictional biography of 007 um, and the new continuation novels. Anthony Horowitz has written his third one. It's brilliant. And he sets those in the past, interweaving with the Fleming timeline quite interestingly. I think all possibilities are open. You could have 
female-led spin-offs. As you know, there was going to be a Jinx spin-off uh, written by Purvis and Wade, Neil Purvis, Robert Wade, directed by Stephen Frears, and that was stymied because the studio felt female-led action movies wouldn't work. You could have standalone movies based on Bond villains like Joker, you know, working have Goldfinger or Safin, or that IP could be really exploited. But none of that will happen, I don't think, until you have, you know, an established new James Bond, Eon Mark 7. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we're going to go younger because, well, we have to, because, you know, not that being 52, 53 is too old for any role, but it's it's that moment of Bond's opportunity. Also, physically, as, as Craig's proved in the last couple of films, he, he got more injuries just and they take longer to heal as you get older. So that, that, that's a factor. I feel the Amazon thing, which has not been, the ink has it's not even been written on most of it. Uh, the Amazon thing is still in the hands of the ombudsman and the regulators and all of that. So that could or could not actually finally happen. But I think for me personally, I really like the idea that Amazon might be the sort of, uh, the, the big tech older brother uh, or younger brother even of Bond. Because it, it kind, Bond, Bond franchise kind of, kind of needs it. When Marvel posts a new teaser poster or a new teaser trailer or the first look at a Spider-Man costume, the figures, the traffic is is big and very instantly big. Bond doesn't quite have that yet because I think Bond Bond needs to reach out to slightly younger audiences. Um, I, I was saying to a New York paper just the other day that uh, we can have all these Daniel Craig era Sam Mendes nods to DB fives and those leather you know leather armchairs and that veneer mahogany veneer world of Bond, and we can allude to 1964 and 1969, but that has less and less relevance to uh, Bond. A lot, a lot of kids who will be hopefully going to No Time to Die, particularly in America, are going to it because of Billie Eilish performing the song. I mean, she's been amazing box office. You know, she's got 40 million hits on her No Time to Die appearances on Jimmy Kimmel and uh, on the Brits. She's the one that's kind of bringing the kids into it. And that was a very clever casting on the part of the music studios and the House of Bond for that. Uh, I, I, I think we're going to go an actor early 20s, uh, sorry, early 30s, late 20s. There's a few names. Lucas Holt, as AJ often says, is, is a really good call, just visually. He's a really good, uh, uh, you know, hot, young, handsome presence. There's a, there's a guy called Harris Dickinson, who's the new Kingsman uh, in, a, in another delayed spy caper that's hopefully coming out soon. I mean, all the names often get touted even now, you know, Dan Stevens, um, Mr. Poldark, Mr. Grantchester. That's just uh, Sunday night TV PR elves doing their job. Bond, <laughs> with perhaps the exception of Sean Connery, Bond has never been Sunday night totty. So uh, I, I think we can forget all those headlines. Those headlines are just a, a tribute to the fact that Bond headlines get read and uh, shared. I wonder if, you know, we may go a little different, but we will always go British, but there are other actors out there um, we, we mustn't just name actors. You know, Idris Elba got named count, countlessly just because he was the only black British actor that any Vox Pops or headline maker could think of. No one actually asked him if he wants to do it. Um, but there are other actors. Barbara, I mean, I've got big faith in Barbara Broccoli alone. Not only did she see Daniel Craig storming into a scene in 1998's Elizabeth, and that's when she thought, oh, my God, there's a leading man who doesn't know he's a leading man, and it turned out to be Daniel Craig. Layer Cake was never his audition piece. It was a period drama. I have I have faith in her for keeping an eye. And she's already had an eye. This, this suggestion we're going to take some time out and have a break. Yes, they should. And yes, they will. But, you know, Barbara Broccoli is a frequent theatre goer. She supports independent cinema and mainstream cinema. She's often sat in many an audience throughout London's West End and Manhattan. Next year, she's pr uh, producing Daniel Craig. Uh, as Macbeth on uh, Broadway with um, Suturit Lalab doing costumes from No Time to Die. So sh who it could be, I think, is already in some mental mix somewhere. I would, I would suggest that, despite the we're not looking at a future husband yet. Yes, she is, because the divorce came through on this film, sadly. <laughs> what we've just seen, all of this is just the beginning, because in 2034, the copyright on James Bond ends and it will become public domain, and then virtually anyone can do lots of things with Bond. And we're entering uncharted territory in terms of IP and copyrights. We've seen it with Tarzan, Sherlock Holmes. And I think with Bond, we're entering a phase that we just can't ever believe that, that will exist. And this is just the hmm. past is but prologue. And that to me, with Amazon's funding and with 
the opportunities there, not just, by the way, for films or TV, but will be pleasantly surprised by what Bond could be. And, and legitimately, the video games, all sorts of other media that don't exist. After all, Bond was incredibly successful on GoldenEye 64. Why couldn't you have a series of incredibly successful video games? There is one coming up, Project X. So I think the possibilities are boundless. And I have a lot of faith in that they do them relatively well. And hopefully with good pairs of hands and good guidance and more importantly, funding. The future of Bond, you know, it's more than James Bond return. James Bond will flourish. Yeah, I mean, everyone always assumes that the, the, the heir to the throne is Greg Wilson, who's Michael Wilson's son, and we're looking at the template. Oh, that's what happened before. There are lots of up-and-coming names uh, who have, if you just look at the end credits of No Time to Die, you can see who Eon's, you know, next generation are, and they're already experienced, and they, they got their experience, as Greg Wilson will testify, in the Daniel Craig era. And that's not a bad, you know, but we, we've been treated as um, as audience members, but they've been treated as uh, mentees, if that's the phrase, or, or pupils to how to make these films and how to go forward with it. And I, 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 say, I actually, I've got a lot of faith in, in the House of Bond, you know, still being the House of Bond. It's not the House of Gucci. <laughs> Well, there you go, folks. Uh, thanks for taking part. AJ and Mark, you both provided a wonderful discussion on No Time to Die. Thank you. No worries. It's, I, it's a movie I need to watch again. I certainly will watch again um, because it's uh, because there's a lot more to sort of compute and sort of digest about it. And um, my, you know, my first initial experience of it, I was like, well, this is really entertaining. And my girlfriend, Natalie, was crying by the end. So it worked on her. That key. That's really important. Well, she, she prefers the Craig films out of all of them because, as you were saying, AJ, it's, it's appealed to more female viewers than ever before, I think. It's it's good that it's now become far more global with its appeal and Craig is certainly a, you know, a major part of that. As mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, if you want to check out their books, you can find links below. Okay, take care, everyone, and bye for now. Thank you so much. Cheers, Ollie. Thanks for asking as well. Bye-bye.